So we seem to be missing a couple people on the board. Do we we know they're all coming? Uh, I think Brian is still in close touch with them right now. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
great. We'll, we'll definitely uh, put that together for the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, you know. So I just emailed the team and they, I asked if the closed session is almost wrapped up and Paul said no. So we might be a little bit longer, we're not sure. No problem, we're just gonna sit and wait. The nice thing about Zoom meetings is I can actually do some work while I'm waiting. Okay, I'll be right back then.
Hey, Jen, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, and everybody should be joining now. We just ended closed session. Okay. Can you hear me, Jen? I can hear you. All right, thank you. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Tom, I like your virtual background. Looks like you're on vacation somewhere very nice. That's Mauna Kea on the big island. Figured, uh, although the picture is reversed. I don't know how that happened when I downloaded <laughs> it, but <laughs> on the wrong coast. <clears throat> And there is Mark. I see Mark. Got Mark coming on? Okay. Okay, and I think that's everyone. Okay. Uh, very good. We'll get uh, we'll get started. I'll call the uh, meeting of the West Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency for a uh, regular meeting for May to order. And uh, a little verbiage here, pursuant to the governor's executive order N29-20, members of the West Sacramento Flood Control Agency staff are participating in this meeting via teleconference to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Members of the public were asked to watch the meeting live stream and submit comments to writing in writing by 9 a.m. on May 21st, 2020, which is today. So uh, with that, uh, we'll move to the agenda and uh, I will, oh, roll call, right? Yes. So uh, okay. Jen, you do roll okay. call. Chair Ramos? Yes. Chair Ramos? Here. Here. Vice Chair Sandine? Here. Director Lazesma? Here. Okay, all are present. Please continue, Chair Ramos. Okay, thank you. Uh, first item is presentation of uh, from the public on matters not on the agenda. Uh, did we receive any, uh, any notices via uh, electronics or whatever? We did not receive any email comments regarding the agenda for this meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 1B, report out of uh, closed session. Good morning. The board did meet via teleconference in closed session um, on the matter listed on the closed session agenda. It took no, no reportable action. Thank you. Um, item 1C, monthly year-to-date revenue and expenses. Uh, I believe, Jen, that would be back to you. Yes. So I'll be reporting out on the revenue and expenses for the month of March 2020. It was brought to my attention that the monthly cash flow report wasn't included in the agenda packet. So to correct that, I posted it to the website and provided it to board members yesterday. So apologies for that. And so moving forward, in Fund 870, the beginning of balance was approximately $3.8 million. The agency received 42.5,000 and expended 16.6,000. 
the ending cash position for Fund 870 was still the same at approximately 3.8 million. For the Fund 871, the starting balance was 4.5 million. The agency received only $15 in revenue and expended 439,000. Majority of those costs were going toward federal project design activities. And that makes the ending cash position for Fund 871 to be approximately 4.1 million. Looking at the year-to-date position, including all three um, funds, 870, 871, and 257, the position was at 18 million. As of May 13th, 2020, the agency's combined cash position was approximately 17.4 million. And with that, I conclude my report. Please let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Any, any questions from Board members, hearing none, uh, thank you very much, Jen. Um, thank you. Consent agenda items. Uh, items two and three on our agenda and four are consent items. Uh, is there any questions or comments on the consent items? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I'd like to pull, well not pull or update item number two, the RFMP grant contract. Uh, just an informational item, two things. One, on the funding agreement, it's in the draft form, and staff and DWR are working through the draft for formatting and signature blocks and stuff like that. So the uh, draft that was attached to the report mentioned Trillia. It's just because it's in draft form. There's no material changes that are going to happen to the agreement other than formatting. The second thing was that we didn't hammer out the schedule um, of cost for the NBK contract, and we worked through that. And it mostly had to do with noticing because it's a three-year contract about when the consultants uh, incur cost increases that they need to pass on to uh, uh, for their work to the agency. Um, we're going to insert that in the contract. And it's mostly about noticing the agency in advance so that we can review them and improve them uh, going forward. Those are the only two um, things in the, in the package for this item that I wanted to update the board on. Okay, so that, that doesn't uh, make any changes to the resolutions that we have. No, no, no material changes. Okay. Um, well, then, very good. With, with that information, uh, I would entertain a motion to move the consent agenda. I'll move the recommended action. I'll second that. Moved by, oh, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Jen, would you uh, take a roll call? Sure. Um, Director Ledesma? Aye. Vice Chair Sandine? Aye. Chair Ramos? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you very much. On to regular agenda items. Um, item five was presentation of our fiscal year 2019 projections and uh, consider resolution to approve uh, mid-year adjustments for year 2020-21. Um, Roberta, are you with us? Or Becky, or whoever's uh, making the presentation? It's actually gonna be me today. Becky, <laughs> making it today. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let me try to see. Good morning, let me see if I can get this screen sharing to work. I'm... All right, We Roberta and I practiced yesterday to make sure I <laughs> understand how to do it. Well, all right, here we go. All right, good morning. Um, so today I am presenting uh, the WSAFE uh, proposed midterm uh, changes to the budget for fiscal year 2020-2021. Um, so similar to the agenda report that was submitted, um, I want to give a little bit more of an in-depth in -depth look into the WSAFE fund structure, um, go over a few of the major funds as well as some of the new uh, budget changes, and then at the very end, there are two recommended actions um, in today's agenda report. The first one is a resolution approving the midterm um, budget adjustment changes for fiscal year 2020-2021. And the second is a resolution um, delegating authority to the general manager for use of um, an approved contingency. So looking at uh, Wasafka's fund structure, uh, the fund structure includes um, an operating fund. So this is the fund that houses 
all of the flood assessment revenue um, and is also the general operating budget for the authority. Um, this fund uh, covers expenses for debt service payments, uh, distributions to the reclamation districts, contributions to the city for flood support service staff, uh, general operational costs um, of, of the agency, um, as well as local support for some of the capital projects. So the capital projects are um, housed in Fund 871. So once again, these are, are partially um, funded by some of the flood assessment revenues uh, that are transferred out from the operating fund, as well as uh, funding from state and federal um, reimbursements. The third fund is 257. So this is what houses the uh, state DWR advanced funds. Um, the city holds on to them. Uh, they're transferred to the capital fund um, on a reimbursement basis uh, upon approval by the state agencies. There are also three other funds um, that are on this slide, and these are all um, related to uh, the debt service payments. So uh, there is uh, funds 882, 883, and 884 for the 2011, 2015, and then 20, the new 2020 with Safeco bonds. Uh, the uh, funding to cover these debt service payments is transferred out of the operating fund twice a year. So next is looking at the city's flood support services fund 652. So as I mentioned in the last slide, um, the Wasafeca operating fund makes a contribution to the city to cover the flood support services staff. Um, that are this is all accounted. The support service staff is all accounted for in flood and fund 652. So this covers the personnel costs, office supplies, um, any training and travel. Uh, as well as the general support cost allocation for the flood support staff. So that general support cost allocation covers things such as payroll, uh, HR, IT, uh, finance, uh, facility operations and maintenance, vehicle maintenance, um, et cetera, different things in that nature. So currently, um, there are 6.76 FTEs that are funded by Wasafeca. Um, this is the same number of FTEs um, in both fiscal year 2019-20 and fiscal year 2020-2021. However, um, we are looking into moving the flood support service staff, um, which is currently housed under the Community Development Department, into the city manager's office. So in doing that, there will be some changes in some of the positions that would be funded um, by Wasafeca to make it more appropriate to the new department that it would be under. Uh, once um, that actually happens, I will bring a revised APL and then any associated budget changes that may be needed um, due to the changes in that APL uh, uh, back to the board for approval. And then one additional thing to note, um, the uh, indirect cost allocation um, went down, is, is proposed to go down a little bit um, in the upcoming fiscal year. Fiscal year 2018-20, it was about 100.4%. It's dropping to just under 99%. Uh, and then two years ago, we were up at 115%. So it is starting to go down. All right, looking at uh, the Wasafeca Operating and Administration Fund 870. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the fund that houses all of the flood assessment revenues. And then the expenses are primarily broken down into five main categories. So the first one is the distributions to the reclamation districts of uh, a percentage of the flood assessment revenues. The uh, second is just uh, miscellaneous operations and maintenance costs. Um, so these are things such as legal lobbying costs, um, audits for Wasafeca, um, banking fees, et cetera. The third is um, transfers out for our debt service obligations. So um, these are for the uh, 2011, 2015, and 2020 bonds, although the 2011 bonds are now retired um, as they were advanced refunded to the 2020 bonds. Uh, one thing um, to note is when you're looking at the dollar amounts, the fiscal year 2019-20 is significantly higher um, than the transfer out for 2021 uh, or 2020, 2021. And this is due to a few months ago, we came to the board um, asking for approval um, to change how we uh, meet our debt obligation. So historically, 
we transferred out of the operating fund at the time in which we made the debt service payment. However, um, it is best to always make sure that you were reserving one debt service payment ahead. So what that meant when we um, changed how we did that is that there were actually three transfers to the debt service payments in the current fiscal year, and then it normalizes next year. So we're always making sure that we reserve the March 1st and the, no, and the um, September 1st each fiscal year to make sure that we are reserving one debt service payment ahead. The fifth um, category is the newest one, and this is related to uh, the newly adopted operating reserve policy. So the operating reserve policy states that we will maintain a reserve balance or a fund balance in the operating fund equal to the expenditure cost in that fiscal year. So uh, we reserve that amount. Once we meet the first four categories of obligations, any fund balance that is above that reserve uh, we are transferring out um, to the capital fund to one help support um, to fund the local share of uh, a lot of our capital projects, but two also to bridge the gap for some of the deficit while we're waiting reimbursement from state and federal agencies. All right, so looking at what I did is this is uh, the operating fund. Um, I just kind of collapsed it just so we can isolate. Um, the changes that were being requested um, in fiscal year 2020, 2021. So the majority of the changes are related um, to two different items. The first one is related to the uh, advanced refunding of the 2011 bonds um, and the creation of the new 2020 with Safeco bonds. So we're requesting a reduction in the transfer out to the 2011 bonds as we're no longer um, having to uh, make those debt service payments an increase um, to the transfer out for the new 2020 bonds. You also see a little bit of a savings, which is why we did the advanced refunding of about um, a little, just under $150,000 on an annual basis. Uh, also, uh, in closing out the 2011 bonds, um, there was a little bit of a cash balance, and this is uh, due to in, uh, investment earnings, uh, throughout the life of the, the 2011 bonds. So I'm requesting that I uh, transfer that out of the uh, 2011 bond fund back into the operating fund. The second is uh, requesting an appropriation for uh, the anticipated uh, transfer out of excess or uh, surplus uh, assessment revenue to the capital fund. So right now that is anticipated to be just over $1.6 million. Um, and because with the new operating reserve policy, we're transferring more of the money um, that would have typically just stayed uh, in the operating fund to the capital fund. Where you, um, I have done a small decrease in the investment earnings as the average daily cash balance is now lower than it was uh, previously. The new only um, new item that isn't related to those two uh, things is we are requesting a $25,000 general manager contingency. So you'll also see a kind of a mirror item on the capital side. Um, this is more for operational needs, whereas the other one is um, related to more capital needs. Um, but for both, uh, the reason that we're requesting this is, you know, in support of the West Sacramento Levy Improvement Program, as well as the implementation of the uh, federal project, there's various support services and professional services uh, needed to support those two. So in order to allow the agency to be as flexible and as timely when securing services for these two items, in order to meet some of the critical delivery objectives and timelines, we are requesting a $25,000 general manager contingency in the operating and then $100,000 um, in the capital. So um, the use of these contingencies is outlined in Resolu the resolution 20-05-03, um, where we are asking uh, to provide the general manager signing authority up to $50,000 um, under these contingencies, but not to exceed on an annual basis of his appropriated amount. So that would be, he can't exceed more than 25,000 in the operating and no more than 100,000 in the capital. And then anything that is signed under that, his delegation would then be reported at the following uh, board meeting. All right, so next is uh, Fund 871, which is our capital projects fund. So what this slide shows is all of our ongoing 
uh, capital projects, the total budget, um, our expenses through the end of April, what the remaining balances are on those projects, uh, and then any new requests for fiscal year 2020-2021. We have three new requests. One I just talked about, which is that 100,000 for the general manager contingency in order to allow us to be um, timely um, to meet some of the needs of the WSLIP and federal project. The other two we talked about during the adoption of the two year, but didn't forgot to actually fund. So historically, uh, the flood support service staff for the time that was related to just general JPA support and the W slip program activity was charged to a program number and then um, reimbursed on a monthly basis by Wasafeca. However, that reimbursement was only for the salary and benefits uh, tied to those to the time charge to those programs. So what ended up happening is that we had a huge year in true up historically to kind of recapture um, primarily some of the general support costs that are tied to those positions. So last, during the two year, we had recommended that we change that and actually have them start to charge time against two work orders that are locally funded. So that on a monthly basis, we're starting to recapture not only the salary and benefits, but also some of those general support allocation costs um, so that the year-end troop will dramatically decrease. And so what I'm doing here, requesting here, is to actually fund those two items. All right. So, um, and then as far as the fiscal year 2019-2020, um, there are a couple items um, that we are projecting to go over the budgeted amounts um, one was related to, uh, we have had a lot more legal fees than anticipated because we did um, the advanced refunding um, for the 2011 bonds. And then the second is um, we did not implement charging to the two locally funded work orders until mid-March of this year. So the uh, true up amount is anticipated to be higher than we budgeted because of this. Although we do expect that now that we are starting to do this, it's going to decrease in 2020, 2021. Um, so once uh, we uh, have finished our 60 day accrual period, I will be back um, for requests for any um, potential um, budget changes that may be needed for a year in true up. Um, so kind of a summary of the midterm proposed changes. Um, there's a few budget adjustments that are related to the, ref the advanced refunding of the 2011 bonds um, and the creation of the 2020 with Safeco bonds. Um, a couple of adjustments related to the implementation of the new operating reserve policy. Um, the third is uh, the request for the general manager contingency of 25,000 in the operating and 100,000 in the capital fund. And the fourth is um, an allocation uh, a budget request to uh, fund the two locally funded uh, projects. One is the general JPA support work order, and the other one is the W slip program activity work order. So um, now we reach the point where I can answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, and then, of course, uh, we are looking for um, action on two different resolutions today. The first one for the midterm um, adjustments for 2020-2021, and then um, the resolution delegating uh, signing authority for the state general manager. All right. <laughs> any questions? Well, thank you, Becky. Uh, very, very good. I, I followed about 80% of it, but... <laughs> 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 so, but, uh, it, it, you know, in my opinion, it's, uh, I, I like the transparency and the, clear, you know, clarity of, uh, you know, how it, the direction it's headed, but, uh, uh, Roberta, do you have anything to add or? Sorry, finding my unmute button. That's all right. <laughs> Nothing really to add. I think, you know, this was a, a full presentation um, just showing the results of several actions that the board has taken recently. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that all of those actions, of course, were, were really good things to do, um, you know, making sure that we're funding 
uh, the next debt service payment, primarily at the end of June, we, we will reserve that debt service payment for September because the assessment revenues don't come in until December or January. And since we're no longer necessarily maintaining all of the balance in, in the um, 870 fund, it just makes good financial sense to go ahead and do that. So there were there were several adjustments in 1920 that the board uh, took action on that I think um, inc improve the uh, financial position um, and, and the operations of the of the agency and the authority. Um, so you're just seeing a lot of that today kind of explained all in one uh, piece rather than piecemeal. Um, so I think this is a, a uh, very good budget going forward. I think that we've got a lot of uh, fiscal policies now in place um, that serve to protect the agency and their finances. Um, so we're very appreciative of the actions the board has taken um, and we're hopeful that you'll adopt the resolutions um, that we're recommending today. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, Babs, any questions, comments? I really, I really appreciate appreciate the comprehensive nature and the presentation, and also um, the the more frequent uh, true ups that that has been. Um, it's easier to to follow, I think, rather than at at the end of the year, once a year. So I really appreciate that, and also um, providing the GM the the some ability to manage uh, a portion of the budget and have that some of that flexibility. So uh, I, I do think there's been a lot of work going over the last year or two um, in creating, a, uh, as, as our chair said, a transparent budget um, and, and one, one that we can take up all at once. So I, I really appreciate the work that's gone into this and thank you. Oh, and um, Tom, uh, th thanks for the time. But uh, of course, this is a really good step. I, mean, I don't have the history that that you and, uh, and my colleague, Vice Chair Santine, have uh, in terms of the cadence of the finances and, and the budget. But um, certainly can see going forward how this would help, really help um, us have a really good firm grip on on the funds, how they're being utilized, and where we're where we're. Um, kind of ensuring that the, the fiscal responsibility is there and the controls are there. So no, as usual, Roberta's uh, and her team are, are um, on top of it. So no, this is very good. Okay, well, we're we're the stewards of this, uh, this assessment and how it's used and spent. And it's good to, you know, be able to see, uh, you know, clearly how, how the funds are being, how the funds are being used. And it's, uh, I'll be appreciated too by our, our our partners out there that we're going to be hooking up with too. So, um, with that, I I would make the motion to uh, move the two resolutions twenty o five dash o two and twenty o five dash o three as presented. Second that. It's been uh, moved and seconded. Jen, would you take a roll call vote? Okay, George Ledesma. Aye. Vice Chair Sandin. Aye. Chair Rima. Aye. Okay, motion please unanimously. Okay. Um, Becky, if you if you wouldn't mind, would would you uh, forward that presentation to the Absolutely. board? Absolutely. So we yep. just put it in our packets. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Okay. Thank you. Um, move on to uh, Item six, A, uh, flood restoration update. Paul, would that be you? So Paul is having technical difficulties at the moment. I am asking the board if maybe we can rearrange um, A and B. So Brian should uh, would go first, updating you on the borrow set restoration. Is the I board okay with that? I think that's fine. Okay, Brian? great. <clears throat> All right, Jen, can you please queue up the presentation? All right, we have a presentation here on our borrow, Southport Levy Borrow Site Restoration Project. 
So the duration of the project is anticipated to be May through November 2020. They've already started on the project. And when I say they've already started, they've already started prepping the site and getting their water ready. They haven't hauled yet. Next slide, please. So a little background on the project is we're going to restore the River Park parcels where dirt was sourced for levee construction. When the levee was built, West Safe could borrow dirt from the adjacent property. Those properties lie adjacent to Village Parkway right now. So we need to restore those properties to their existing conditions, the conditions they were before the levees were built. The property owner indicated that he wanted to farm before. Now he anticipates building subdivisions in the area. So we need to make sure that he's whole again and restore the elevations back to what they were before we borrowed dirt so that they're not mini dirt pits out there now. So the methods that we're going to do this is we're going to haul this free dirt from the Sacramento County Regional Sanitation District in Elk Grove. In Elk Grove, they have the Echo Water Project where they're expanding the treatment facilities. So there's a lot of excess dirt there. And we entered an agreement with them for a dollar and eight cents for 600,000 cubic yards. So hence it's free dirt. We just had to pay basically a transaction fee. So with that dirt, we're gonna haul it to the site. We're gonna spread and compact it on the River Park parcels per the compaction specs that we came to in agreement with the property owner. And then after everything's complete, they're gonna slurry seal Gregory Road. That's anticipated to go in October, 2020. Next slide, please. So the haul route is on Interstate 5 from Elk Grove. They get off it on Interstate 5, get off Laguna Boulevard from the treatment plant property, go on I-5 and exit Jefferson Boulevard. They take Jefferson Boulevard down to Gregory Avenue. That's why before I indicated they're going to have to slurry seal Gregory Avenue. Gregory Avenue is not in the best condition currently, and we anticipate that the slurry seal will need to be done after the truck haul. So the hours of operation are Monday through Friday, 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then Saturday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And the above hours apply to the limits within the city of West Sacramento. That's all our residents are gonna be disturbed by the 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. window. And the contractor is currently trying to avoid work on Saturdays. So hopefully the contractor can avoid work on Saturdays so that way when people are out there recreating along Village Parkway or in the area, they don't have to deal with the trucks. and it will not impact people's travel on the weekend if they need to go shopping or do other activities, which has been limited lately due to COVID. Next slide, please. So the residents in the area were notified. The residents along Gregory Avenue, Buck Rogers and his daughter, and the house that backs up to the parcel, River Park A4, that's on Davis Road in Village Parkway. And some properties along Jefferson before Gregory were also notified by De Silva Gates. The notification letters went out yesterday. We ran them by Paul Hosley at the city and the communications department just to make sure that we were containing everything that we needed to be. And the message was in coordination with what the city wanted to get out and what the contractor needed to get out. So the haul trucks are gonna start on May 27th or 28th next week. The date is not certain because we need to approve the survey for that. This is where we're really going to see an impact. And basically, this is why I'm giving you guys the presentation, because you guys might get calls from people. What are all these haul trucks doing? There's a lot of traffic on the road. So the haul trucks will start next week, either on Wednesday or Thursday. It's anticipated start date now. Like I said, they've already started, but they're just prepping the site. It's not really interfering with traffic or anything that the residents are doing. And the residents are told the haul trucks will leave Elk Grove starting at 4 a.m. and continue until 4 p.m. Before I said that work limits are in the city of West Sac from 4 a.m. to 6 p.m., but they probably won't be seeing any impact until 4.30 to 5 a.m. in the city of West Sacramento. And the haul trucks are gonna stop leaving Elk Grove at four, which means they have until six to get out of the city of West Sacramento. So the last load will leave Elk Grove at four. We anticipate them, depending on traffic, to arrive anywhere between 4.30, 5 o'clock, dump at the site, they're gonna do some scraping and be out, but they gotta stop at work in West Sacramento at six for the truck hauling. So that way the residents aren't too impacted with commute traffic. And I'm saying this not too impacted with commute traffic, this was all planned before the shutdown. And we're still trying to abide by these rules that are set in place per our environmental report. Next slide, please. 
So here's a close up view along Village Parkway right here. You see the top hatched parcel. That is River Park A2. And then right below it is A4, which abuts the property at the intersection of Davis and Village Parkway, which, Jen, can you hover over that with the mouse? Right up there, yeah. That's River Park A2, then below it is A4. And then we have River Park 3, which is adjacent to the levee, adjacent to where the mouse is right now, and then A1, which is over near the Buck Rogers property. So that gives you an indication of where the parcels are at and how they're going to be. And as a reminder, the trucks are coming down Jefferson, Gregory, and then Village Parkway, and they'll enter through the cul-de-sac at Old River Road to fill these back parcels that you see that are adjacent to the river, and they'll exit along Village Parkway. Next slide, please. So a few more tangible vis visibles for you here. This is the regional stockpile at the Sacramento County Regional Sanitation District. I included a picture of our construction manager here when we had the meeting there, just to give you some perspective. You can see those cranes in the background in the road. That gives you an indication of how high the stockpile is. It's a mini mountain. It doesn't compare to the Sutter Buttes, but it's one of the other larger features in the middle of the valley. We were up there and it was amazing how high we were in the middle of the valley on this big stockpile. So that's a stockpile from all of their work there that we entered the contract to get. So D Silver Gates is gonna load those trucks and they can't get on the road until 4 a.m., but they will probably be loading in Elk Grove starting at 2.30 a.m. So that way they can start at 4 a.m. Next slide, please. So this is the entrance to borrow site A2. Chair Ramos, you might've seen this as you were driving by, you mentioned earlier on our call that you saw some of the prep work. So that's site A2 to the south. They have the gate along there. It's hard to see, but there's wire ropes behind those striped barricades. So they have the K rails and the wire ropes connecting the K rails, those striped barricades prevent anybody from getting on site. The gravel's nice and compact there. So that way the trucks can get on site without disturbing the adjacent roadway. Next slide, please. Another perspective, A2, looking a little bit to the side, you can see there's a little bit of a pile back in there, but it's sunken immediately beyond the K rail. That pile is a spoils pile that they're gonna spread over the top of it. That's the existing topsoil that was there. We wanna maintain the integrity of that topsoil for vegetation growth until it develops. But that hole, they're gonna fill with the dirt from the regional sanitation district. This gives you perspective of what's going on there. It's hard to see out the CAD drawings. Next slide, please. So this is A4. You can see this gate that De Silva Gates built. Sorry, no pun intended there. But they have their equipment back there, and this is leading to borrow site A4, right along Village Parkway. This is standing at Village Parkway, looking back towards the levee. Next slide, please. So standing back a little bit, middle of Village Parkway, and you can see the faint distance. It's a little bit sunken behind there. It's a large parcel. Next slide, please. So this is borrow site A4 from another day when we were out there doing the pre-con. This is shortly after it was discs. You see there aren't many weeds there. And it's a little bit sunken compared to the background. It's a little bit faint in the background where you can see the levee, but you can see adjacent to the levee where it seems a little bit higher to the parcel. It just gives you some perspective about the parcel and how much that we have to fill there. Next slide, please. So there were some questions asked by the board before about environmental mitigation. And if you guys get any questions about anybody trying to talk, talk to you about how this tr is impacting the environment with all these trucks, to remind you that the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District had two mitigation measures that we had to fulfill. Our NOx mitigation fee for our on-road vehicles, which is a truck haul. That fee was anticipated to be $35,000, but we've gotten it down to $13,000. I looked at the paperwork that they were filling out and I used our complete construction schedule, which we were able to do in Sacramento as opposed to just the holidays. So that reduced our fee. So we're paying this fee for the pollution that we're doing with the on-road trucks over the duration of the construction project. And we also have to demonstrate that our off-road vehicles have reduced NOx emissions, which we were able to do working with the Silver Gates, our contractor and the environmental consultant. And that wasn't difficult to do because the standards they use are for older equipment. And a lot of the contractors that are doing this work have newer equipment on site, these larger contractors. And the newer equipment is 
more efficient, energy efficient, and emits less pollutions than the older equipment. So for example, you want to talk about a car, the worksheet they have might be talking about a car from the mid 90s for emission standards, whereas a contractor is using more modern equipment. Modern cars have less emissions than those old cars due to the way the equipment's configured. So another environmental mitigation measure is we purchase climate action reserve credits. We had to do that per the EIR based on some of the pollution that we're doing. So we set up an agreement and those have already been purchased. And regarding wildlife, we have a biologist on site for tree and ground nesting birds during construction, because that's one of our other environmental mitigation measures that we have to look out for to make sure that we're not disturbing the tree nesting birds, the swains and sock, which are an endangered species, which nest in the area, and to also be sure that we're not disturbing any ground nesting birds. And since the site was just right before they were starting construction, we have not seen any ground nesting birds and we don't anticipate any ground nesting birds. So next slide, please. So to conclude this presentation, the contractor has their COVID-19 plan and they require masks for all public interaction. So if anybody along Village Parkway is running, riding their bike, wants to know what's going on, the contractor will be wearing masks when they interface with the public. That is the contractor's plan and also coincides with Yellow County Ordinance. And when the contractor is working with the construction manager or anybody else, they're required to wear masks for their interaction. And also West Safeco will have a construction manager WSP on site. So they'll be there monitoring the contractor and they will also be available to answer any questions the public may have or any residents if they go up to them. And also West Facebook staff will be there and our assistant will also be there inspecting the work. He's done a good job on some of the levy inspections thus far, as you can see here. So that concludes my presentation. Want to know if you guys have any questions? Chair Ramos, Director Ledesma, or Vice Chair Sandine? Get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I, I, Chair, I have a, a, a couple of questions. Um, thank you for the presentation and uh, preparing us for what's what's ahead. Would you remind us about um, the input and the process for getting us here, just in terms of um, when the public has had an opportunity to comment on the, the process? I think it's been the last two years that we've um, gone through the purchase process, et cetera. Well, yes, and more recently for this project, we had to do a supplemental EIR because they didn't anticipate hauling dirt from Elk Grill. So that supplemental EIR notice was sent out. And there was a public comment period, and we had a public meeting at City Hall. That's back when people could still meet in person. Right, right. So they had plenty yeah. of opportunity there, and then we've given notice of construction, the bid on our website, so they could see about that there. So there's been plenty of opportunity for the public to comment with the initial levy construction, which this was supposed to be done following, in the new supplemental EIR. Okay, and, and then my second question is, is there a, a staff member that's been um, tapped? I don't know if it's, it's Mr. Fabin or Mr. Dirksen or, or you, um, who will be the, if there are comments and input and feedback from the public, um, who, who might be fielding comments that, if we get those, for example, if, if Mr. Ramos or Mr. Ledesma, I, um, hear from folks. We, is there one person on the team that will be helping with um, responding to concerns or comments? I could take the easy way out and say it's Mr. Fabin, but in actuality, okay. it would be myself. <laughs> so yeah, please contact me if you have any concerns and I will work on it. Or if I'm not available for any reason, I'm out in the field, can't hear the phone, you need immediate answers, feel free to call anybody at West Safeco, but I'm going to be taking the lead on this. And I will right. be working with our construction management staff that's on hand in case we need to go to any residents, talk to them, maybe bring them copies of paper plans or email them digitally plans if they're not comfortable with that so they know exactly what's going on. Yeah, it seems like um, just anticipating um, when, when folks actually, when things actually start to roll and the trucks start to roll into town, um, people have questions and, and this is part of the bigger project. And so I think it's just a reminder that, that we have levy protection now that we haven't had before, and this is part of how that happened. So I, I just think the context is, as I know you know, is really important to this part of the, the, the process for the levy protection. Yeah, and then to add to that about the public commenting, yesterday at the executive 
committee meeting for the city of West Sacramento, this was brought up. And this presentation and the letter that the contractor sent to the residents was sent to police. And police is going to share that with fire because they were both interested. So that way they know exactly what's going on, when to anticipate the traffic. So when residents start talking to them and asking them what's going on, because we anticipate we will get complaints, right? There's gonna be a lot of trucks on the road. That way they're aware and know what's going on. But to our advantage, we have the shutdown and the slow reopening. So we're not gonna see as much traffic on the road as we usually would. But we anticipate there won't be as many people that are disturbed by these trucks interfering with their daily commute. Thanks. It, it does seem like to uh, Mr. Fabian, I don't know if, if you um, want to share this with the, the whole city council. I, I think this is something that uh, we don't have a meeting until next um, Wednesday. It seems like um, the, count, the council may need to have a uh, background. So as, as the council's representative on this board, um, I may... I'd like to ask for that, um, just that, that folks are have the background in advance of my being able to share it at the council meeting next week. Um, so this is Greg. So um, what, what exactly are you asking for? Well, I think the council needs to know that the community, like a little bit about this, about the presentation we've received, um, at least in some kind of summary form that the, that the residents nearby have, have received this and the, the extent I've, I've shared updates at every every council meeting after a was safety meeting I share what's happened and what actions we've taken in the background but mm -hmm. um, I won't have that opportunity until next Wednesday so um, okay um, so are you the thinking... city, maybe through the city manager I, I I'm not sure the mechanism but I think this this isn't something even if the council's heard me talk about this it seems like um, this is like fresh right now. Maybe yeah, put some two or three brief slides together then so he can give a canned su summary of this presentation. And then any other groups? I don't know, uh, Mr. Ramos, if, if I, I'm not sure if your RD needs to know or Mr. Ledesma for RD 900. I'm, I'm not sure if there's other parties that need to be um, kept in the loop. But anyway, for me as a council rep on this board, on this JPA, I'd like to request that. Well, it's, it's the trucks that are going to be the obvious thing that people are going to um, want to know more details about. And uh, I think just your uh, making sure that the other council people who, you know, may get calls and or city informational people are just aware and they can inform people as to the hours that they're going to run and what the circumstances are. And I think as the information gets out um, and, you know, there's any wrinkles to work out. I mean, that'll happen. We're, we're lucky that we got a uh, a good contractor with the Silver Gates this time. That uh, you know, we'll address things if need be. So, um, I'm uh, anticipating it goes smoothly. We'll see. So, um, and thanks uh, for the presentation as well. And this was always part of the big, the construction and and. Uh, we we all knew this this uh, the impacts to traffic and the impacts to the community that this could have um, and not being part of this board until the, the um, this year um, haven't had to deal with it um, directly in terms of uh, as we are here trying to manage and anticipate issues as a we're in the council member hat I think. Uh, uh, Director, uh, Vice Chair Sandine is absolutely right in terms of uh, making sure that the rest of the community, uh, community leaders, and I would apply that to the Reclamation District um, folks, just to make sure that remind everybody that this is starting its potential impacts and, and sort of the response um, people and mechanisms in place so that Chair Ramos's confident in this contractor and that's great and they'll, they'll, they'll apply it. We got to make sure they're aware um, and directors at RD 900 as well as those on council and those in other um, right, the correct places and, and, and this, if it's available, the city's uh, uh, community uh, relations staff uh, and, and public information staff. And we're all sort of on the same page about how the information gets funneled to the right people, whether it's Greg or Brian, whoever, 
Um, so it, it, it just, that, that is part of the overall or, or overarching um, values that I want to make sure we have going forward. And um, yeah, this has to get done. Um, and I think it's our responsibility to make sure um, that we inform the public as it comes on. I, I appreciate that you're going to be available um, to, to answer questions directly to residents. Um, and, 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 and we are to a degree um, as much as uh, uh, shelter in place pandemic <laughs> scenario is con we can consider ourselves lucky um, because typically on um, uh, we'd be dealing with uh, traffic on Jefferson and impacts to that. But I think we are going to have at least the first few months, weeks, months as we sl slow into uh, the, the, the various stages of opening up. Um, we, we have a period where maybe those traffic impacts we anticipated. There's also been in past impacts, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, Greg, you brought up that, that police uh, have been informed because I know in past construction projects where trucks and, and Jefferson is the only, I was going to be clear, Jefferson's really the only way to get in and out of this. There's, I mean, there's no other alternative. I mean, I, I suppose you can think Village Parkway, South River Road north, going north is a Clarksburg Bridge. It's not an alternative. This is really the easiest path to get to these sites. Um, but my my concern, or, or in the past, I'm thinking of past uh, impacts, including the Bogle construction, uh, and then even the levy construction. I mean, there's, I know this has been issues of uh, truck speed and truck um, um, uh, um, whatever I call it. This this messes from the truck have been sort of sort of complaint or pain points uh, that is dirt falls off or whatever. Um, so how will that be managed? Is that where you, we in coordination with the police force on the city's police force on that? Yes, we will coordinate with our construction manager and the police force. The contractor will be responsible for any mess that they make. Okay. And this is Greg. Uh, and to your point, Chris, I think it would be good for us and, and Brian to you too for for us to um, be proactive about um, the traffic speeds along Jefferson Boulevard, uh, making sure the contractor are driving and their and their haulers are driving responsibly. That's been a Kind of a sore subject over the. Yes, it has. <laughs> it so has. We'll, we'll, we we can even, stay on top. Yeah, even the even the, they're hitting. I mean, a large trucks full of full of uh, uh, soil. So, um, to the person who's walking or biking, which be mindful, a lot more people are um, in this shelter in place. Them zooming by you on Jefferson Boulevard is a pretty big visual impact and so they may be going this this the, they may be going on the speed route uh, the speed uh, limit but it's going to feel like they're not and so i'm not and again i'm not you can't mitigate that it's just we got to be prepared for that yeah so i've been taking some notes through this and um so babs will get um a, i think a subset of the uh presentation um, along with a brief explanation connecting this to the Southport project and this being the last uh, phase of construction to complete that. We'll get that out to the city council. I think we'll also coordinate with um, the, um, the cities um, uh, with Paul Hosley, as well as I think um, since we're in this still sort of a shutdown mode and there's um, limited access to city staff or answering phones and stuff, we'll get this to the various touch points for when people call into the city, whether it be public works operations and or community development, we'll um, get them a, a, you know, a one pager of this is what's going on. This is, you know, kind of what we're getting to the council and uh, as well as phone numbers for them to refer people to Brian, Brian will be the primary point of contact, but really if you, if you want to email Brian and, and copy all of us, we, we all are stay well abreast of what's going on. Brian will be the lead, but we can all um, step up as needed, so. Hey, Brian, I got one question. What what do they anticipate the completion date, at least for hauling, will be? Well, it could be anywhere between August and September. Okay. 
And I say that because there are unknowns with how many truckloads they get a day, and we might be getting some free dirt from our friends across the river. Right. Un un understood. So that that's just that should be another thing that people are ready to answer. You know, it's going to last through the summer, you know, till into possibly September would be a good answer to give folks. Well, I said project duration May through November on the front front of the slide. Gotcha. November would include the slurry seal because that's what we have to complete it. And you never know with construction, if there's equipment breakdowns, if there's something on I-5 that blocks it off with their construction to one lane for a week, then we're backed up another week. Understood. That's going to be uh, something they got to work through. Yeah. So dealing with the public, we just want to be sure that we're covering the full extent that we need to. We don't want to tell people that the hauling is going to end in August and then they see trucks in September and get mad at us because we told them August and they still see the trucks. Yeah, and I understand that, Brian. I, I, my, I would agree with that. Um, with that general, you know, you, we can't say hopefully completed by the end of fall, something. But I, I, I get it. Um, so again, just, 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 just to ensure we are kind of managing the community's uh, pain points as they come up. And again, we we may have caught a break here with a little bit because of COVID and the shelter in place, but we should be prepared on all fronts. Okay. Thank, Brian, thank you, Brian. Brian. I just have I just have one more question too. Could you remind me the number of trucks truck loads per day on average that we'll be experiencing? Up to three hundred and eighty truck loads per day. That depends on how fast they can get them loaded, but they're anticipating anywhere between forty to fifty two trucks. And they'll be coming in pulses. I think we could probably, with all the folks and shelter in place looking for things to do, we could probably create some sort of, can they decorate the trucks and make some game out of it? Whoa. I'm just kidding, guys. But again, it's going to be, um, I think we may have caught a little bit of a break because of traffic, but. Like a Little League parade. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> make it fun. Have the kids count the trucks. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Brian, thank, thank you. Um, Moving on, Paul, were you able to get on? And if so, not, uh, Jen and I are going to, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, hey Chair Ramos, if I could interrupt for just a moment. Uh, I do have a hard stop at 1030. I need to uh, break. I was giving you a heads up. So. Okay, well, then uh, I'll make it quick because uh, we need to hear Greg. All right, well, Jen and I are going to go through this cooperatively. Um, I have my presentation up. I'm, I'm, um, called into the meeting. So here's uh, here we go. Here's an update on floodplain restoration for uh, for the board. Um, Jen, go ahead. Are we on the second slide? Yes. Okay, great. So I don't know if you've been out there, but um, the contractor has now completed um, putting milk cartons around all of the plants that have been out there. Um, you can see the sign there that talks about uh, the fact that um, they, they're showing that they are spraying and there are toxic substances. This has not seemed to impede people accessing the levee in any way, shape, or form, from what I can tell. There's still a lot of activity out there. Jen, go ahead. And they placed down all those milk cartons to make it easier to apply um, the pesticides. And so you can see here they're applying it by. Um, with a tractor, uh, pulling, a, um, pulling a pumped um, container with pesticides. They go all the way through the rows. The, the, the design allowed for this kind of uh, spraying. And so that was a, that's why all the milk cartons are out there. The contractor believes that this is a much more effective approach to, um, to being able to deal with all of the, uh, the weeds that grow up um, during the, uh, from the wet season. Go ahead, Jen. And then one of the things that we noticed or that the construction management noticed was that there seemed to be some, um, some plant mortality. So River, we spoke with River Partners about that. Uh, they organized a crew, I believe last week is when they began, and they anticipate completing a complete census this week. Um, go ahead, Jen. Oh, so uh, 
Yeah. So there's a couple of other things that we have to look into. Uh, this will be a future item that we're going to discuss. There, even though we had a low water year, um, even on the some on the occasional rain that we did have, we did have some rilling. Um, we had some of these uh, some of these failures along the O and M corridor. So we're going to talk with River Partners about. Do we let them go? Do we repair them? How much of do we repair? Um, that's something that we'll be discussing in the future. So the schedule of work uh, is to continue with um, weed management through herbicide applications. Um, they've provided a new watering schedule and their intention is to do deep watering once a week and run the pumps 24 hours. We've yet to see that happen, um, but that is their intention right now. The, uh, it's gonna take a little bit of time to tabulate uh, the plant loss in the census because they have to go back to look at what was supposed to be there relative to the as-built drawings. Um, but once that is completed, River Partners will reach out to the nurseries to order some replacement plants. Um, it's their intention to uh, do the replacement planting um, probably in June, July, if they're available through the nurseries, so that they can establish before the rainy season. Um, they'll be, like I said, they'll be under the irrigation system, and um, and that's their intention. So that's kind of where we are. And last slide. Anybody have any questions about floodplain restoration at this time? Hey Paul, if I may, uh, may Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, so the, the first slide, and again, maybe I wasn't clear on this, but um, the love, the 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 spraying, and your your comment that folks um, are still recreating. Are you saying that, or, or, or do we not want people up there right now while we're we're we are doing this work, and they're still up there? So, or they, or, or were they going down into the into directly into the area? On occasion, people do go down into the offset area. Um, the point that I was trying to make is that even though they put up the required signage to show that they are spraying, um, they're, they're applying the herbicide, it doesn't seem to have an impact on people using the levy. Um, so they assume a certain amount of risk I'm just going to say that, um, and but at the same time, River Partners is doing what they're required to do for their contract. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Mark, sure. uh, Bab, do you have a, any questions? Just Paul, I assume they expected some mortality rate on this on these plantings. Is it? kind of consistent with what was expected or and you know, uh, you know Tom I don't um I haven't heard the final count I heard that in the north offset area that they had mortality of about almost 15% which I thought was a little bit high on the high side um but I think that the one thing to remember um that I haven't been too detailed about is that they're doing a full census and when it comes to our mitigation requirements, we're really looking at the um, the trees and not the understory that they planted. And so I don't, hopefully by the next meeting, I'll have a better understanding of um, what are the principal plants that maybe that show uh, that, you know, that we've had losses on and then what are the secondary ones? So I'll look into that and try to report back to the board next month. Okay, gotcha. Anything else, guys? If if not, we'll we'll move on to Greg. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. All right. Thanks, Chair Ramos and, and board members. I'm going to jump straight to the federal project in light of the the, the time restrictions. Um, we continue to advance design on the federal project. Uh, all of the lab work is uh, just about complete. That that BCI is doing and um, which is feeding into the geotechnical basis of design. Uh, we're on track for the 65% design milestone. Uh, I think our deliverable is June 22nd uh, from the, uh, our design firm, MGE. 
Uh, and the way the design yeah. is shaping up right now, it looks to be, um, I don't know if the board recalls, but uh, the GRR recommended a slurry wall in the northernmost section and the southernmost section of, of the Yolo Bypass Reach. Uh, through, the, through the geotechnical investigations, both existing data augmented by what um, BCI did uh, on this particular, on this project, the additional borings, um, it looks like the northernmost segment, which is um, AE, it does not look like it's going to need any remediation, that it's good to go. Uh, the southern section in lieu of a slurry wall, uh, it looks like the recommendation is going to be a landside seepage berm. Um, and then the middle segment for which the GRR did not really anticipate uh, any remediation, it looks like um, we're going to be doing a uh, recommending a seepage remediation, which consists of a, a drainage solution. The Corps had installed um, a, a drainage solution for work they did on a slump um, over a decade ago, and it looks like we're going to be recommending to continue that uh, solution um, on the remainder of that reach. Um, in terms of, we're also going to get a cost estimate along with the 65% design deliverable. Um, we're hopeful that uh, given the reduction in scope, i.e. no slurry walls anywhere, uh, that we're going to see also a reduction in the, in the cost for construction. And then lastly, um, based on all the surveys that were done and the wind wave erosion analysis that was done, it looks like there's going to be some revetment placed near the toe of the levee along the, um, I, for most of the reach um, in, the low, in the portion south of uh, Interstate 80. So that pretty much sums up the design. We, we've gone through a number of, we've had, continue to have meetings with the core. We've got, recently we're going through this safe, I'm sorry, not safety, we're going through this um, risk um, review process with the core, which is a, a brand new process. We've had a number of uh, conference calls with the core um, and another series of calls are gonna um, be had next week. Um, and this is from a risk perspective, this is supposed to help inform uh, the design and, and possibly any design refinements um, between the 65% deliverable and then the 90% deliverable. Uh, thus far on the one completed um, risk review by the core on other projects in the region, it did not result in any changes to the design um, that was recommended. So hopefully that'll be the case with us too, and we can stay on track. Um, and staying on track is completing design by the end of the calendar year. Um, the core is also doing an economic update of the project right now. Uh, we have provided a revised schedule um, and phasing um, overall project schedule for completion of, of the federal project, as well as the phasing of the, uh, the con, um, of the reaches to be uh, constructed. Um, our PM um, is recommending that new revised schedule to the econ group that's doing that cost update uh, and economic update. And uh, if they take it um, as presented, it will likely result in a BCR of around 2.6, um, which, uh, which would be above the, the magic 2.5 that um, the core likes to see um, for funding projects for construction. So that's all good news and I'll continue to keep the board um, apprised as that process moves forward. It, they'll go into to sort of a black box period once they've received all the input. We won't hear anything for quite some time, um, but they are also looking at uh, getting us um, a chance to review the draft economic update before that goes out for their agency technical review where they ship different pieces of it out to other districts to um, for a, um, a certification process that they go through. So I'll keep you posted on that. On the advocacy side of things, um, both of our lobbyists, the city's lobbyist, Holland and Knight, as well as the agency's lobbyist, uh, Mike Strawn, through Federal Water Consulting, are uh, keeping tabs on everything going back and going on back in DC. Most everything, as you know, is related to COVID-19, um, but they're also tracking, um, keeping their ear to the ground on any potential um, infrastructure stimulus packages um, that may be coming. Uh, so far, um, we've heard things that may be on, on the house wish list, if you will, um, but there's nothing concrete uh, in terms of expectations for an economic stimulus package. It is anticipated that the normal 
um, appropriations bill process will also be used um, as uh, an economic stimulus for um, for the country as well. So um, we're, we, we are expecting that there will be full funding uh, for core projects through the, um, the normal appropriations process. Uh, staff sent an email off to um, the San Francisco division just to give an update on the good work that was Safeco and the Corps are doing um, and uh, kind of being a cheerleader for our project and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, respectfully recommending um, that we might uh, receive a new start status and, and construction funding in, in any um, uh, core funding recommendation that might be coming forward. Stimulus or, or regular, and um, per and I got a response almost immediately back from the from the San Francisco division um, with very candid response that uh, the West Sacramento project is the uh, San Francisco division's number one priority for New Star construction, um, and they're messaging that um, both for a normal funding um, process through the the fiscal year 21 work plan, as well as recommending um, the West Sacramento project for new start construction in any stimulus package. And they, and she went on to say that it's the only new start that they're recommending for such a, um, for construction. So um, very encouraging. And then uh, additionally, um, the mayor um, just issued a letter uh, that we helped put together for him. Uh, to the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. Uh, again, uh, letting him know the good work that we're doing, reminding the ASA of the time he spent um, land side, or excuse me, water side in the offset area at the completed Southport project for which he was very impressed with the work that Wasafka had done in constructing the Southport project, reminding him of who we are, what we construct, um, and, and, how, and that we're gonna be ready for construction in the spring on this next increment. And again, respectfully re uh, requesting new start construction funding uh, for the next effort. So teeing things up uh, for the fall and funding for construction. Um, and so far the feedback has been um, very positive. Uh, any questions on the federal project, uh, either for um, the design effort that we're undertaking and or the um, advocacy? Questions, guys? No questions, but that's uh, really promising. Thanks for sharing that. The mayor actually shared that he had sent the letter at our council meeting last night. Yeah. All I can say is keep chopping. <laughs> See what we can yeah, do. Yeah, we're, we're doing our best. Um, and then the only other thing that I wanted to talk about um, from the packet that um, you guys received was just, um, Paul continues to do uh, really great work. The whole team does in pretty much everything they do. This is one of the best teams I've ever worked with in my working career, but specifically to the former Time Oil site, um, Paul's done a really good job working with the SCAP program staff. Um, we're getting a contract amendment because there are additional funds that, um, we're not getting a contract amendment, but there are additional funds available within the current contract to um, cover the cost of um, a well abandonment. Um, it looks like, um, based on the last uh, round of testing, that no further action is going to be required. Um, a no further action request is being submitted to the regional board. Um, we anticipate being able to close the site, and then we will also have funding available to do the well abandonment. So um, good job to staff getting that teed up. Very good. And I think that's, that's really it. The other staff has covered most of the other, you know, sort of highlights um, on the other work that we're doing. Okay. Well, um, Chris, I know you got to go. So is there any other, any other things? I only have in terms of director's comments. It, it looks like we may have received um, public comment on item 1A. It doesn't look like it came in as with the requested public comment not notation on the email. But Jen, you may want to look at that. Um, uh, it, I think we all got copied on on a public comment. Well, you can make oh. that for the record, I guess. So, yeah. It, anyway, it just it, it doesn't. It, it it's requested that the notification go in as public comment in the subject line, and that's not how we received that. Anyway, but for what okay. it's worth, I think um, 
because we have this stilted way of doing the meetings now. Um, you may just, oh, I, just wanted you to be I just wanted you to be aware. It was on item 1A, which is a closed session. No, no, I'm um, sorry. I, uh, it was public comment. Public comment, just not, not on the agenda. Right. So, yeah. all right. Okay, I mean, is there any, we, we don't need to uh, search it out now, do we? It's, it can just be part of our. Right, it's for the record to, to okay. make sure that we know that we received something, but it, I don't think it arrived in the form that, um, that, okay. that was requested on the agenda. Okay, I just I have one question if whether we know or not. I mean, if we uh, see the lifting of the uh, stay at home and whatnot is is expected to return to uh, in person meetings at any time or or uh, we don't know. I can probably weigh in on that. I know um, <clears throat> at the city level, we've got a team working on a reopening plan. Um, I actually have a meeting scheduled to go over that um, with the team tomorrow. So I'm not exactly sure what the timing is. I'm, I'm assuming uh, starting starting in June, potentially mid-June. Um, so we'll have a, a better update on that um, probably after tomorrow. But I know that we are working on a, on a reopening plan. So... Okay, well, with a three-member board and uh, our usual attendance, uh, I think we can do our distancing fairly well. So, I would Hopefully. say you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> if, not, um, if not June soon, we'll be able to all you know meet in, meet in person. Can I make a quick request too? It sounded like Jen did not receive the uh, public comment email that you guys received. So if somebody could forward that to Jen so she could make it part of the official record, that would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Roberta. Sure, thank you. All right, if that's it, um, I'll uh, consider the meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Have a great day. Hey, bye. Thank you. Have a good one, guys.